Dr. Laura Roberts, Editor-in-Chief for the Books Portfolio of the American Psychiatric Association, and welcome to the APA Books Podcast. Today we'll be discussing telehealth and psychiatry and the role that communication technologies can and do play in mental health today. While telehealth generally has grown pretty rapidly in recent years, it's an area that was pioneered by psychiatrists and which is really uniquely suited to the needs of our field and our patients. To help us learn about the role that communications technologies can play in clinical care today and in the future, I've invited both of the editors of the book, Telepsychiatry and Health Technologies, a guide for mental health professionals to speak with us. First, we'll talk with Dr. Peter Yellowlease. He serves as the Vice Chair for Faculty Development and a Professor of Psychiatry at the University of California, Davis. He also is a world leader in telehealth and presently serves as the President of the American Telemedicine Association. We'll also be speaking with Dr. Jay Shore. He's an amazing young leader in our field, and he serves as a professor in the departments of psychiatry and family medicine at the University of Colorado, Denver. So, Peter, tell us about this wonderful telepsychiatry and health technologies book. It really envisions a very different future uh, filled with hope for a lot of people living with mental health issues. I think that's true. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we thought about calling this book sort of almost hybrid psychiatry originally or hybrid mental health, but we thought people wouldn't understand that. Well, what, what do you mean by hybrid? So what I mean by hybrid is how I practice. I, pr- I see my patients both in person and online. And I see them online in several different ways, potentially via video or through e-consults or uh, either synchronous or asynchronous uh, consultations uh, using video, potentially with uh, secure messaging or email. Uh, So essentially, I'm a physician who works both in person and online. Patients can choose whether they come to see me in person or online. So if you come to the psychiatry clinic at UC Davis now, you get offered the option of seeing people uh, either in the clinic uh, or assuming your insurance supports it from your home on video. And that's now the routine in our outpatient clinics. And uh, so we train our residents to work in that way. We train them to use uh, you know, my chart, which means they message with the patients. Uh, and they're also seeing the patients at home on video. Um, so, so this is the way we're going to be practicing the future. There's just no question about it. Um, you know, the younger generation in particular, anyone under the age of 30 who's, who's what I think of as being a digital native, in other words, they've never known life without the internet. This is how they live, and they want to see their physicians in this way. You know, increasingly, psychiatrists are actually being very flexible about this and are, and are actually working more in this way so that patients have better access to them. And quite honestly, I think you have a better relationship with your patients. How do you develop a better relationship with your patients through this hybrid approach? So, so it's actually a much more patient-focused approach, if you think about it, because the patient can choose how they wish to see you. Um, and they can see you in person or on, or on video, or you know, they can connect with you uh, via other different technologies. Um, uh, and so you have a much more flexible doctor-patient relationship. It's not just based on the fact that the patient's got to travel to see you. Um, So they have more choice and it's much more convenient for many patients. The interesting thing about seeing patients on video is that there is a group of patients where it's clearly better to see them on video than it is in person. Now that's counterintuitive, clearly. Most people assume that the gold standard for any, certainly for any psychiatric uh, consultation should be uh, an in-person consultation, but I I just simply don't believe that. Um, if you think about any patients who, you know, who are anxious, maybe with, you know, agoraphobia, with some paranoid ideas, or particularly patients who've been traumatized, uh, there is a strong uh, sort of series of, of reports in the computer science literature of the fact that people are more relaxed and more honest if they can actually see people through a computer in some form or another. Uh, and that's not surprising. I mean, if you imagine that, you know, you'd, you'd been abused yourself, uh, perhaps, you, you know, you, you'd had some, uh, you know, sexual attack on you or something a week before, if you then have to come and see a male psychiatrist in a, in a room in a, a place that you don't know a week later than that, you're going to be anxious about that. It, the actual distance, extra distance that you get through video is, is actually really allows more intimacy in many situations. One one of the big differences that we found in, as we see more and more patients using technology, um, is is that you can actually get more intimacy through the video uh, with certain groups of patients than you can uh, in person. Um, 
And, and that intimacy can really improve the relationship that you have. And patients can then choose when they want to come and see you using whatever modality. And so I used to argue that we should always try and prove that using telepsychiatry was as good as the in-person consultation, okay? Now I say to people that if you are not using this approach with at least some of your patients, you are not providing a best standard of care. Uh, that's a challenge for, for many psychiatrists, but I think I will be found to be completely accurate on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Could you comment a little bit on where we are in psychiatry in relation to other fields of medicine and these kind of different technologies to help support this new model of, of healthcare? Sure. So psychiatry is a leader in this area. Um, and, um, you know, there was somewhere around between probably one and a half to two million patients treated using video last year. That's actually a lot of patients. Um, if you look at the VA in particular, they, as a, as a system, saw something like 350,000 to 400 veterans for psychiatric reasons on video uh, in the past year. Um, so uh, the same is true of correctional institutions. Um, the um, the, the uh, CDCR in California actually employs 35 full-time telepsychiatrists. Um, so psychiatry is actually a very advanced specialty, quite honestly, compared with most other specialties in terms of uh, the use of these technologies. And it's obviously because it's relatively straightforward. You don't need too much hands-on. The message that, that we want to get across in the book is that you know, this is the way we should all be practicing. There's just no argument about that anymore. Um, you know, you, the, our patients prefer us to be flexible and to be able to see them in lots of different ways. Um, and we think that this is it's quite clear the evidence now that this is the, the best way of practicing. And if you're not using these technologies, you're really not practicing as well as you could be. So a, a, a real difference from when I saw my first patient through a telemedium, it was a very primitive kind of televideo system in New Mexico no. and the computer, right? was that it was primarily viewed as a strategy for reaching patients where they were geographically remote, so rural and remote frontier communities. What you're speaking to is just an entirely new approach, what, you know, relevant to urban populations as well as people who are in remote areas. Could you comment just a little bit on that shift from just viewing it as a rural health strategy to a mainstream every patient strategy. Yeah, I think I think that that's exactly the case. Um, you know, and that's uh, why I say, you know, look, if you come to visit UC Davis in, in our and our psychiatry, our patients in the middle of Sacramento, if you live a mile down the road, you can still see us in your home if you prefer. Um, and I think that that approach is sensible. Um, I think actually the, the, the previous approach of, of it always being thought of as being just for long distances has actually in some respects slowed down the actual integration of these technologies into normal clinical practice. Um, but, uh, you know, I think if you, if you, once you make that, that jump that, you, that obviously you've clearly made, that, that this is how you should be practicing with everyone, um, then it ultimately becomes a, a matter of patient choice. Right. I, I think one of the virtues of the book is that it does address some of the ethical issues that people are worried about. For example, confidentiality, secure methods of communicating with patients. Could you comment just a little bit about how to approach all of these many issues that people may feel a little overwhelmed by as they think to change their entire way of practice? I think that's, that's a really important point. And, and, and the interesting thing about the whole area of telepsychiatry is that patients have been wanting to work like this for years. The, the problem children, quite honestly, have been the adults, have been the, they've been the providers. Um, it's, been, it's been the physicians who haven't wanted to do this because, as you correctly say, they're the ones who actually have to uh, change much more. Um, uh, and so it is complicated. I mean, people somehow think that just sort of sitting and doing a consultation in front of video conferencing must be simple. Um, but there are a whole lot of regulatory issues, as you say. There are a whole lot of IT standards that you need to know. Now, there is, the simple fact is that those are all in the book. It's all very straightforward if you know what you're talking about. Um, but, um, but it can get you into big trouble if, if you don't. So if I, if I use one example, the, the current uh, opioid crisis. It is very difficult to um, prescribe, basically, you know, the, the medication-assisted treatment uh, uh, meds that you need to give to, to um, patients with uh, opioid problems over telemedicine. 
because there happened to be uh, a, a set of rules that were put in place by Congress that were originally put there to try and shut down uh, offshore pharmacies that were um, the source of too many narcotics. And, and so by chance, that led to some difficulties with, uh, pre pre with prescribing controlled substances on over video. And so, you know, there are a whole lot of rules and regulations. You suddenly find you've got to know what does a BA DEA do, um, why, why are regulations different in different states, uh, what sort of licensing things do you need to sort out? So it is complicated. Um, and, and it changes all the time as well, because uh, particularly the states change their rules all the time. Um, so again, it's important to know where to go to get that information. Right, and can you comment also on how billing practices may vary from state to state or system to system? Sure, um, the billing is a, is a huge issue in this whole area. Um, interestingly, most uh, insurance companies are actually pretty good at billing. Um, for, for telemedicine, and increasingly they, they allow you to see patients at home, not just in somebody else's clinic. Um, uh, the, the problem people in the billing area are actually um, the, the feds um, and Medicare primarily. Um, so Medicare has very complicated, unrealistic rules that basically say you can only see someone on Medicare if they're in a defined rural region, and then only if they're in certain types of, uh, of clinical environments. Um, so, so Medicare has been a real problem, um, and uh, and I'm hoping that that's going to be changed in the future. Uh, Medicaid is different in every single state, despite the fact that it's a, a federally funded system, because the states have put in different rules to support or otherwise a Medicaid program. So, any provider who's going to do telepsychiatry, you know, has to look at what are the rules for their own state, and the, and the rules are all different. Now, um, the American Telemedicine Association actually does keep up keep an updated list of all the rule changes on its website, um, which is a really good reason for you know any uh, any psychiatrists or other mental health professionals to actually join that association, um, uh, because these rules change over time. Um, but uh, you know, as long as you're aware of what the situation is, you know, it's it's ultimately not that difficult. But but it's like every every clinical process, you know, you've got to be careful. Um, which in reality is what we're all preaching about. So just think for one second, what, when you thought about coming for this interview, what other things do we want to touch upon? So one of the things that you'll find in the book is really a description of how you can be a hybrid practitioner, how you can see patients both in person and online and, and get away from this sort of, I guess, historical view that it somehow has to be either video or in person. Uh, what I preach very much is that it should be both. Um, uh, and, and so in my office, in my university office, I have um, a computer with three screens and I have you know, a good camera and a good echo cancellation system so that I don't need to wear headphones. I can see patients you know, using uh, those, that system wherever they are, um, or I can see them by just turning to my right and talking to them in person. Um, and I think we've moved away from the time where you need to go to a sort of telemedicine center or any special center to use this technology. And, and uh, so we've recently put two screens on every single one of our resident desks here. So that, and plus a camera and, and an audio system so that they can routinely do these uh, consults from their own rooms. And so that's what we're really uh, aiming to do now is to essentially turn all of our practitioners into hybrid, hybrid psychiatrists. So Peter, one of the issues that I know many of our colleagues are thinking about is how to maintain kind of appropriate constructive therapeutic boundaries, professional boundaries with patients who may text them through the night, uh, might text them every single day, would call every day, um, and that that really isn't in the patient's best interest uh, in terms of their own well-being. So how do you think through the professional boundaries when you're using these different technological media? I think that's a really important issue, and it's something that we've described in the book with a, a series of sort of basic house rules. Um, but essentially, I mean, let me tell you what I do. Uh, I mean, on my card that all my patients get, I have my cell phone number and my email address. You know, I tell patients that I would prefer them to contact me either through the MyChart system on the EMR or email. You know, they have my cell phone, virtually none of them ever use it, okay? Um, 
but um, and, and, and I specifically tell them that I'd rather they didn't phone me um, because I travel a lot. I'm not around. I hate playing phone tag and trying to catch people again. And, and I say, basically, if, if they need to have a long conversation with me, then probably we should, we should meet. And we can meet either in person or on video. But if it's for something short and relatively easy, and you know, we just need to sort of do a few th short things here and there, then, then I'm happy to handle it on email or on, uh, on, on secure messaging. You know, we have secure email systems, so that's not a problem. So, so I actually deliberately untrain my patients to use the phone I, I, because it, it takes too much time. It's, it, it's too, you know, gets in, gets in the way too much. And, and, and actually that way around actually works very well for most patients. They love being able to email you or, or message. Um, and they accept the fact that, you know, the phone is, is, is more difficult and it's also awkward for them sometimes. What I've done is changed the way I practice quite significantly. Um, and actually, it keeps the boundaries more certain, quite, to be honest. How about with the emotionally distressed patient, a person who becomes suicidal? I mean, how do you... How do you work with this kind of very acute situations? So, and, and so clearly, you can't have an absolute rule. You know, if if there are those situations around you, you know, you clearly have to talk to people. Um, uh, and I'm not saying I would never do that. Clearly, um, but but what I'm saying is I'm trying to get away from the majority of the phone calls that actually can be quite time consuming. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but you clearly have to be able to do that. So so, and that's actually one of the reasons people have my cell phone. Um, because, you know, I am potentially available like that. Does that cause love disruption? Is that a real boundary issue for me? You know, it, it actually isn't. Uh, I mean, I'm personally used to having my email come to my phone. You know, if I get the occasional phone from a patient directly to me, it's not a big drama. Um, uh, you know, most of us are getting used to the fact that our email is permanently there. Um, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, if I'm going to be away from the office, I deliberately put a message on saying, you know, you can carry on emailing me, just don't expect a reply, you know, in the first 24 hours. <laughs> um, so I think you need to have some rules. Um, but like all things, the rules have to have a degree of flexibility. Thank you. What else? So one of the things that I think we need to do as we increasingly work differently and work in this hybrid way is, is think about changing our roles more and more into becoming uh, essentially educators, mentors, teachers, um, and people who are not doing so much direct patient work, but are working in teams and working with groups of social workers, health coaches, psychologists, whoever it is, um, to increasingly, you know, give opinions to, and to manage groups of patients. So to manage, you know, all the patients in a health system who have bipolar disorder and who are on lithium and make sure they've had all of their, their um, labs done and that they're all up to date or to review uh, you know, the EMR for all of those people who have too many um, uh, ED uh, appearances or things like that. So we need to start thinking as psychiatrists of how can we be more involved in population health, in managing larger groups of patients than we have in the past. And in reality, in spreading, in spreading our skills and expertise much wider than we are able to do through individual therapy. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that we've done in the book is actually to do a calculation on uh, you know, how many more patients um, could we supervise um, if we started seeing uh, more patients, uh, you know, using, re regularly using, you know, email or, or uh, using asynchronous video consultations, as well as doing some of these population health-based approaches, working with, uh, you know, teams of social workers. And it's quite clear that we could be way, way more efficient and see a lot more patients and, and, and supervise the care of a lot more patients, particularly patients in primary care, working with primary care teams in, in the sort of, the, you know, the primary care medical home model, uh, using sort of collaborative approaches. So, so I would love to see more and more uh, psychiatrists working in primary care, working in this hybrid manner uh, and thinking about populations of patients rather than just individual patients all the time. Um, so tell me a little bit about your um, collaboration with Jay Shore. So, so Jay and I have been friends and colleagues for 20 years. Um, uh, you know, I started seeing, I saw my first patient on, uh, on video conferencing in 1991. Uh, he was a bit slower than me. I think he, was, he didn't see somebody until about 1995. Um, and we have known each other for the last 20 years. We've written many papers together. We've had grants together. We've collaborated on a number of different activities over the years. 
Um, and, uh, and so Jay and I have always talked about writing a book together. Um, and obviously, you know, this was the opportunity. Um, and so we decided to try and put together a book that would really be a guide for anyone who wanted to use a range of different technologies. So we've covered not just video conferencing, which everybody thinks has been telepsychiatry, but we've covered email and messaging. We've covered apps. We've covered the electronic medical record. We've looked at how you use systems for population health. So a wide range of technology-based approaches in this book. Um, so we've, we've gone into great detail to basically have a how-to book. And it's really a how-to book for, for any individual practitioner up to anybody in a large system. How can they start using technology effectively in mental health? Beautiful. Make sense? Fabulous. Thank you for everything. Oh, that's Thank great. Thank you for being such an inspirational colleague. Yeah. And it's just, I think it's awesome. Well, you're very kind. Really you're appreciate exactly it. the same. No, that's <laughs> listening to Psychiatry Unbound, APA Publishing's books podcast. We'll be back in a minute. So Jay, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm thrilled to have a chance to talk with you. So can, can I shift gears and talk just a little bit about stigma? Because my impression, um, having worked actually in several different communities now in the United States, is that the introduction of telehealth strategies for working with patients is really a wonderful way to dismantle some of the stigma barriers. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if you see that in a similar way. So I think there's a couple ways to... To, to to slice that pie, so to speak. So one, in some ways with the technologies, it does, uh, can create more privacy uh, for patients, uh, meaning that when you're seeing them in their home or their office and they're not having to come into clinics, um, it, it provides uh, a, a more sense of, of privacy and they don't have to, you know, raise their hand and say, yes, I'm going into the clinic it says mental health on it. Um, and then in rural communities, that's even more so if there's only one mental health clinic. Additionally, in rural communities, I think it may help people feel more comfortable seeking treatment because it provides them with a provider that is there, that, that has more of a boundary with them. Um, so, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in, in, with mental health professionals in rural communities, and I don't see any more boundary issues or violations than you do in an urban community, but certainly on the patient's uh, half, you know, when you are doing therapy with someone that you're now going to run into two hours later in the grocery store at your kid's soccer game, that's sort of a different boundary. So, so I think those two things, the technology may help decrease the barrier to access that may be a stigma on an individual level. It obviously doesn't decrease the actual stigma, right? The the public stigma, stigma of mental health treatment. I think on the other side, what's helped decrease the public st stigma is, is just sort of, I think as our culture has evolved, and I think you're seeing it slowly, it's just my opinion. Uh, I think we're certainly compared to where we were uh, 20 years ago, where um, much more self-disclosure culture. And I think people um, across multiple mediums now are much more comfortable than they were 20 years ago. I think it's still evolving about talking about mental health issues. You see stars, celebrities talking about it. You see the press talking about it. You see people on Facebook being sort of more comfortable uh, about talking about it. Uh, I would I would argue it still carries a higher stigma than medical illness, but I see that coming down as well. And then the third way, I think technologies has also provide innovative ways to educate the public, uh, you know, around uh, things like streaming video clips, TED Talks. You can look at Peter's work and his group in, um, in, in, in virtual worlds, uh, uh, 
in, in virtual worlds uh, where they created a program called virtual schizophrenia, which allowed people to experience what uh, virtual hallucinations were like and it's open access. And so, again, I, I think there's a number of different ways that technologies can be leveraged to, to address the stigma issue. Yeah, that's great. Let me just ask you, Jay, are there things that you would like to highlight about the book or things that you'd like to say to the audience who may be listening to the podcast? Uh, what I, uh, I think, as you said, uh, too, what I, I'm really sort of proud of and, and happy about the book is the, the uh, and case examples, I think, is sort of a disservice um, because I think when you say that word, I think traditionally you think of sort of a case report in the margin. And the case examples, about a third are about clinical cases, but the other two thirds are about administrative issues, reimbursement, funding, and what those case reports are intended to do. You read them and they really have sort of a lesson learned at the conclusion and the bottom that links back to the core material of the chapter. And so, what I'm, uh, well, what I hope, uh, and you know, we're in the early stages of of getting sort of readership feedback. But I'm, uh, what we really hoped in the design of that, that that would really, as you said, sort of bring things to life, and make it seem pragmatic and 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 real and approachable for people. And I, I do think for those not involved in technology, there is there's sort of two edges of the continuum. There's some people who think, oh, this is, yeah, I just, I can, you know, start Skyping immediately with patients, for example, and there's nothing else really more involved. And so, you know, they don't think about the licensure, the security issues, the change in clinical style, the emergency, the out outreach and access. So there are some issues you need to be thoughtful about with any technology and understand. I think on the other end of the continuum is some people get so intimidated about all the things I just said. They're like, well, <laughs> I'm not gonna get involved and engage with this. And I think what, what I hope is that the book shows that, as you said, look, this is doable. This isn't, this isn't rocket science. Um, um, if you're thoughtful and um, do a little bit of homework, that it's fairly accessible to begin uh, looking for opportunities to better uh, use more technology, engage with patients, have more clinical opportunities in this area, and there are more system level approaches. So really, in some ways, looking at hopefully that book uh, decreases the barrier to people who aren't using technologies with their patients and uh, but are very interested in, okay, what's this about and how do I approach this in a reasonable way? And it doesn't require, you know, me going back to school <laughs> to do this. It requires uh, me getting some additional education and knowing where some of the resources and supports are. Good. And then are there just, you know, just other things that you wanted to be able to say as you imagined our conversation or... So what, why I love this field so much and telepsychiatry is when I've been doing this for about 20 years, when I first got started, and this is true with video conferencing and other technologies, we basically were trying to just replicate what we did in per, what we could do in person over video or another platform. Now that's really changing and we're using the technology to actually change the models of care delivery, how we see our patients, how we team with other professionals. And so both as an individual clinician, you know, telepsychiatry and technologies continue to evolve in their use. But stepping back at the systems level of care, they're really beginning to reach their potential as being enzymes and sort of the engine of healthcare system change. And they're opening up uh, some really exciting opportunities. And there's really a growing number of examples of how this is happening. Do you want to comment on maybe one or two examples? Uh, you know, so one of the, the sort of obvious and I would say getting to be well-researched in a growing evidence-based is integrated care the provision of psychiatric care within a primary care clinic. We're using video conferencing to virtually embed psychiatrists into other virtual teams and live teams. So these are also blended teams that are both virtual and in person. 
and they're really looking at both providing care to individual patients, but increasing the mental health knowledge and capacity for the population of patients in any one clinic. And, and that's an example where really the model and how we structure and deliver the care has been changed because of the technology. Comment a little bit about how much you love Peter. <laughs> I think I already have, but Peter Yellowlees in particular, uh, for people don't know, um, I think there's a couple special things about Peter Yellowlees for the field of psychiatry. First of all, he's one of he was one of the early adapters of telemedicine in the mid '90s for telepsychiatry in terms of sustainable programs. Um, it was very. Uh, uh, I'll get back to one of the earliest adapters, too, in another comment. And Peter began using this in, in the outback and remote regions of Australia and also began writing on it and has been incredibly prodigious. And then he transitioned uh, his career into America. And throughout this whole career, Peter Yellowlees is incredibly generative and generous with his time to anyone, really a real ambassador in the field. And then to follow up, the other I think was really interesting is we, uh, if in our introduction, we got one of the first uh, telepsychiatry clinical pilots in the 60s, uh, uh, Dr. Fred Guggenheim, who was chair in Arkansas. And he was actually, he's actually here now in Colorado. He retired and is here near some children. And I went and... Uh, I just uh, went over to his place one night, and we sat down, and we had some food, and we began talking. Uh, and and I, I was just kind of interested about what his experiences was, and he told me, which is highlighted in the introductory chapter of the book, of his early experience with this one of the first te clinical telepsychiatry pilots in Boston. And what really struck me, and I hope what is highlighted by that introduction, that case report that he discusses of his experiences, you know, the technology has changed a bit in video conferencing, uh, more than a bit. But, uh, but the human experiences and some of the questions that we even ask today were things that were coming up then and the feeling that, yeah, it's a little different than in person, but if you adapt your style, you can maintain the overall quality of the uh, relationship and get equally effective outcomes and really the transformative power of the technology, um, but also dealing with, you know, the technical challenges in telepsychiatry to me are always the integration of the technology with the system. It's not the challenges around firewalls and making sure your microphone's off and all sort of things that need to be addressed. But it's really the system in it, systematic integration of the distances and to the, the billing, the workflow and all of that. And, and you know, we, we still uh, have to work pretty hard on that. Uh, and, and when they started that service in Boston, those were the same sort of issues they were identifying. So uh, I, I think that's a really neat highlight that starts the book out. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Shore, for joining us to talk about telepsychiatry. I'm thrilled with this wonderful book that you and Peter have put together and uh, really so delighted to have the chance to speak with you today. Thank you so much for having us on and, and, uh, and supporting the book. Our host is Dr. Laura Roberts. She is the Catherine Dexter McCormick and Stanley McCormick Memorial Professor and Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Stanford University School of Medicine. She is also Editor-in-Chief of the Books Program at American Psychiatric Association Publishing. Recording Engineering and Music by Willa Roberts. Coordinating Producer, Kyle Lane McKinley. Executive Producer, Tim Marney. This podcast is made possible by the generous support of Stanford University. We are a production of American Psychiatric Association Publishing, John McDuffie Publisher. Be sure to check out other APA publishing podcasts, including AJP Audio and Sex Services. We are available across all podcast platforms, including Stitcher, Google, iTunes, and Spotify. To purchase copies of this book or other books by our guest or host, please visit 
www.appi.org. That's A-P-P-I dot org. If you'd like to contact us, drop us an email at bookspodcast at psych.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast, and thank you for listening.